Okay. Uh, everyone heard to start over here? One? Okay. I have someone work. That colleague here didn't raise his hand. Okay, so start off. Uh, we, we are a dating unification platform. We do that through the use of knowledge graphs. Um, we spun out of UMD, University of Maryland's AI and Computational Sciences Lab. Farther ago than I care to admit, and we're based in the DC area. We're a small, venture funded startup trying to tackle the world's data problems. Uh, where am I supposed to be? There we go. Um, <clears throat> There's a great quote from an MIT Sloan Review article. Um, and it's kind of related to a sentiment that I think we hear a lot AI, ML will save the world, it will change everything we do. Uh, but you know, kind of hidden under the covers there is, the, I think the key point of this, you know, it's really a data race. All, all the outcomes that we could get out of using those technologies are really driven by the data. Fortunately, we've got lots of data, and we're creating more of it every day. So I read recently that we're creating two megabytes, <coughs> excuse me, two megabytes of data per person per second every day. So that's awesome. It's a data race, and we've got more data than we could ever want. The problem is that it's stored like this. It's stored all over the place in every technology in every format, moving at every velocity. So this is the forgotten V of big data variety. So the, the challenge there is how do we leverage that data? How do we find all the different pieces of the puzzle to build the data and analytics application, the customer 360? The 360 is hidden in here somewhere. So putting that together, creating that 360 degree view out of this is hard. It requires you to, and you change the title of the talk. This is where I was going to say, it was originally had to reimagine. You have to reimagine what your infrastructure looks like. So you know, we think it's built around three principles, flexibility, reusability, and independence. The flexibility to handle that landscape, to handle all the different places and ways organizations store data. Reusability, stop making copies of data. Don't proliferate that scenario. Be able to build on you know, the first use case to help you kind of bootstrap the second and the third and the fourth and continue to move forward. Don't reinvent the wheel every time. Don't make new copies of data and new systems and kind of exacerbate the problem. And then independence, build it. You know, we think on top of the graph, which is, which is a good place to be talking about the power of graphs, uh, but use kind of the flexibility that's provided by graph, but use it as an abstraction. Graph isn't necessarily the point, it's, it's kind of the how to make all of this work. We want to abstract away from all those different technology decisions because some of them are the right decisions. You know, those are, some of those are very good systems for very specific use cases. Go ahead and use them, but free yourself. Make yourself independent from those choices so you can bubble up that information to the people who need it most. And last, then I've said to hear about DAO. You know, how, how we do this at start off. You know, the graph is here. This is what the world of the enterprise sees. All, all your BI applications, your application developers, your data scientists, they see a nice coherent picture of the world. A nice clean graph that's comprised of data from all over the organization. Because none of this actually matters. How it's stored, what it looks like, how fast it's moving, it doesn't matter to the data scientists and the analysts who are just trying to answer a business question. Business questions don't care about that mess, they just need an answer. So you know, we think the way we have approached building knowledge graphs to do data unification in the enterprise, to really enable those AI and ML applications, analytics, really push forward modern data-driven organizations. This is the right way how it's done. <clears throat> With that, I'm going to turn it over to Clancy to talk about how they've been using this technology at Dow to reimagine the news. You still saying that? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks a lot for having me. Um, so I'll start by kind of saying that um, I'm kind of suffering up here as a bit of like, I feel like a bit of imposter syndrome, feeling almost a bit fraudulent in the sense that I know a lot of you know a lot more about, you've probably, this room probably has forgotten more about knowledge graphs than I've bothered to even learn so far. And that's because at Dow Jones, when I started working on some of the stuff that I'll go through, our goal is never to create a knowledge graph. It was actually to solve some very important problems uh, and challenges for our customers. And probably no surprise to you all in this room, um, a lot of those problems and a lot of the sort of opportunities we saw can certainly be enabled um, by uh, reimagining our news and our data in much more of a graph and connected uh, way. So, a brief overview of Dow Jones. Um, Dow Jones, uh, you ask most people, what is Dow Jones? They mentioned the Dow Jones Industrial Average. We have absolutely nothing to do with the Dow Jones <laughs> Industrial Average. Uh, we actually sold that business um, several years ago. 
Um, but our core business is actually, uh, you've probably heard of the Wall Street Journal. We are the publishers of the Wall Street Journal. Um, Dow Jones has been around for about 130 years. Um, before the Wall Street Journal, uh, we actually were working in Dow Jones Newswire. So this is when we were actually delivering ticker tapes to, uh, on Wall Street to the banks and the traders of what news was happening um, at that moment. Uh, we also have uh, other publications, Barron's here in uh, London. We also have Financial News, uh, Market Watch, which is, I believe, the largest trafficked uh, financial news website in the world, if I have that right, um, is one of our properties. And then we also have a very, uh, very successful data business, structured data business. So one of those uh, products is Factiva. Does anybody here, do you use Factiva? Okay. So, Factiva is a news archive, uh, covers up to 50 years worth of unstructured news text from about 30,000 different premium news sources. So uh, all the news that is generally uh, behind paywalls or is in print publications, we have that in the Factiva database. We also make that available uh, via the Factiva search engine, but also through a platform we call DNA, uh, Data News and Analytics. It's sort of the same news, the same content, but made available in a way that works better for data scientists, people who want to work with sort of large archive extractions and streams of all of this content. We also have some of our structured news product, our structured data products like our risk and compliance product, um, basically tables of people you probably shouldn't be doing business with um, and other sort of adverse media entities, for instance. So, one of the things that I think this is probably a, a common thread that um, many of you have dealt with, either yourselves personally or um, through your clients, is that we have all these products, but traditionally they do live in silos. We have um, a lot of great knowledge, but it's sort of packed away in these different products that we have in these different data sets. So we had um, a little bit of a look at sort of what are the modern challenges that we have to consider. What are the things that our, our, our customers are really uh, trying to do with the knowledge that we provide? And one of those, as I mentioned, is that all of this information that's very valuable is dispersed among these multiple products. So we will have, for instance, say an, an article in the Wall Street Journal talking about, let's say, WeWork. And then we also will have a, uh, a, a record about WeWork in one of our other data sets. And then we will probably have another article in another publication, or in Factiva, about WeWork. If you want to get the whole view of what Dow Jones knows collectively about that entity, you actually would have to jump in and out of these multiple products. So I think it's a very common uh, problem that uh, many companies are dealing with. Um, we also have a very changing set of expectations from our customers, both the consumers who read our publications and the professionals and businesses who consume our news content, our data um, en masse. So one of the, the primary challenges is that there's this expectation of um, news being more context relevant, that people don't really these days expect to go and read the entire Wall Street Journal cover to cover and get figure out what they can actually do with that information in there. We're generally creating more and more content, as Mike mentioned, um, across the board, but the ability to consume that content is not increasing in any means. And so customers are, are increasingly saying, how do I actually get more of a personalized view of what actually matters to me in this massive flow of information and knowledge? Uh, and then increasingly, this is definitely by us as anybody in this room, uh, our news is not just being consumed directly by humans, but also um, increasingly by machines, by, by the algorithms that are taking either some sort of action on them or helping the human at the end of that, that chain to actually make better decisions. So making sure that our news and our content is better able to work for both the humans who rely on it, as well as sort of the workflow systems and the tools is, is incredibly important. So when we are looking at some of these challenges, and these are just sort of three of the many that we've identified that we were focusing on in, in different um, respects, uh, we, we started working through like what is actually some of the ways we need to structure and deliver the news of the future for our customers. So in a, uh, this is a little lag. So I'm going to go into like one specific pain point. We have sort of a, a 
bunch of these, but in this case, it's uh, this pain point that we've heard over and over again. It's not, not, I don't think, very, I don't think it's particularly unique, but it's tell me what I need to know so that I can take appropriate action. And here's some examples of some customers, um, actual customer cases that we've worked on. Uh, there's an energy company that wants to know what regulations that are surfacing in the news might affect specific customers so that they can actually perform some sort of outreach to them to say, hey, this particular energy regulation may require you to take some sort of action that may involve a renegotiation of your energy contract, for instance. Or a sales team, and this is a case I'm going to go a little bit deeper into, uh, they want to know, for instance, which of their customers are planning a specific product launch so that they can actually get ready to work with them on, on scheduling a media buy. And uh, one project that we are working on as well is around sort of bankruptcy and restructuring. So when, knowing when a company is in distress, bankruptcy professionals would want to know who the relevant parties are in that bankruptcy so that they can identify how they might get involved in that as well. But so these are generally the, the points that we hear from customers over and over again. Just, I need to figure out what I'm supposed to take action on. But traditionally, a company like Dow Jones, which comes from a very uh, long history of, of journalism, our answer is, well, let's create more unstructured text. Let's create more articles. And that's where we've run into a bit of a problem because verbatim, customers say, I don't want to read more articles. Um, actually, and this is a, a quote from a customer. We were originally, at one point, um, pitching a customer about a, a newsletter feature we have. We said, well, we can take Every time one of your customers shows up in the news, we can deliver that to you in the newsletter. We can do some digesting, we can do some you know, human curation, and they said, please don't do that. Our, our account managers, they're not illiterate, they just don't want to read um, more news. It's just not, it's not part of uh, what, any, what anybody is expecting from us these days. So the challenge that we've been um, tapping into is around this idea of how can we actually share relevant knowledge uh, with our customers without actually just producing more news? And that's where, uh, as we've been investigating a lot of these ideas, uh, the developments that we've been doing with Stardog and building our knowledge graph um, have become incredibly useful. So I'll go into a little bit, um, and I'm not gonna go as deeply into some of the NLP stuff that we are working on, but it is kind of obvious that Every news story, so this is this one's a little bit out of date, um, but the, uh, the Trump administration levied sanctions Friday, blah, blah, blah. There's all this information going on. Um, kind of actually hard to parse, even though it's not that long. It's a lot of text that ex is explaining some really interesting facts that, about Oleg Deripaska and about these sanctions that are happening. Now, this is our traditional way of delivering knowledge or breaking news is, as these blobs of text. But really, um, for the sort of uh, the ontologists in the room, there's a way that we can take all of this information and actually structure it as a graph. And one of the what you can sort of see here, and this is a, this is definitely a mock-up. This is obviously not from our, our actual graph. But we have the idea of like, well, there's a news event, and that news event actually then involves certain people. Uh, it has certain things like timestamps. There's also not shown on here. We actually have articles that refer to that news event. So this is a big paradigm shift for us of moving away from just doing general metadata tagging on documents, actually saying this document is about this news event that's occurred, and here's all the structured information about this news event. So um, everything that was in that article that we just looked at can be graphed and tied to this specific event that occurred, which was um, a US sanctions event on specific allies of Vladimir Putin. Now, what, once we have this data, when we put this data into sort of a, a graphed um, ontology of, of the event, there's some really useful things we can then do for our customers. So for instance, if you care, let's say, about this EN Plus group, whether they are a supplier of yours, or whether they're a customer of yours, or whether they're somehow in your portfolio, or you have some sort of stake in EM Plus, or you, you care about that company. Well, this particular news event, unless you read that article 
and saw the EN plus group uh, mentioned in it, you might not actually know that this event somehow may impact you. And actually, it's just sort of lucky that that article even mentions the EN plus group. Because in fact, many times there's editorial decisions made in the journalism process, in the, in the news process, where certain facts just don't make it into the article at all. But actually, that news event is important to you. So if we have that news event actually graph in this way, what we're able to do is actually infer that if you care about EM plus group, that this news event affects Oleg Deripaska, and Oleg Deripaska is actually uh, part owner of EM plus. So this allows us to start doing some really interesting things around inferring the impact of news on our customers, and actually providing this new sort of layer of personalization effectively for free that otherwise might not be possible if you don't have this sort of structure to the news. It also allows us to do things like taking from that previous article, discovering new facts that might not have otherwise uh, been known to us. So in this case, it mentions that EM Plus Group has a stake in Rusal. Now, that persisting that fact on our graph is valuable for later um, research among our research teams, among our journalists, but also for our customers. So there's sort of two angles that we're approaching here, which is determining the impact of a news event and how it affects customers, but also extracting facts for later persisting them or making them available uh, for other needs. So we're doing this right now. Uh, we've, we've, we've kicked off this, this, this very big project. Uh, we're focusing on specific use cases as we build out um, the events that we're modeling, um, the news that we're putting on. And I want to quickly um, sort of explain what we're doing. So uh, I previously was the chief technology and product officer for uh, our professional information business, the, the uh, business that uh, oversees Factiva, Newswires, all of our structured data, our non-consumer publications effectively. Now I'm working on this internal project where we refer to it as Pulsar. We, uh, we haven't had the marketing people come up with a real name yet, so bear with us. Um, and the idea is that we have built a knowledge graph platform based on Stardog that allows us to do ingestion of facts from all the news that we have access to, as well as connecting it to information that our customers are able to provide us. So in a sort of a virtual graph environment where a customer can provide us information like in details of their CRM, details of their ERP, details of their portfolios, con contracts, um, uh, contacts, um, and make it so that we can identify those items on our graph and then identify what news events may directly or indirectly affect them. Those features are all what we're going to be surfacing and they're beginning to be surfaced in certain products that we have across the Dow Jones portfolio. <coughs> So I'm going to, this is a bit of an example of uh, something that we're actively doing, which is having our uh, news signals as a service. And this, I think, will give a little bit more context to how these work. So a, um, a customer using Salesforce or using a marketing uh, automation tool like a Marketo, or Eloqua, um, Parda, uh, what they were saying is, well, we have all these companies that we kind of care about. There. They're, they're, they're an energy company. They want to know if any of these companies are doing things that may impact their interest in acquiring a new energy contract, for instance. So they've given us a whole bunch of details about their CRM. They basically said, here's, here's either leads or existing customers, and here's our CRM identifiers. And we've ingested that into our company mapping API. We take that information in, we basically map it and say, okay, there's a company called uh, BlackRock. Here's some addresses. Um, we wish everybody used DUNS or LEIs or identifiers, but we have to sort of design for the case of here's some names and poorly formatted addresses. Identify those companies on our graph. Uh, and then we basically are able to connect the customer's CRM identifier. So this was a major change uh, for us because traditionally we've sort of had to have our customers, we put the onus on our customers to map their companies and their data 
to our identifiers. Whereas now we're, we're able to say, actually, that should be our job. Let us talk on the same symbology that you use to identify your customers. And then, as we take these news events, as they actually get ingested, um, we have the, a, an ontology for each type of event that our customers have uh, asked us, have, have designed and built with us. And this is an example of like a article that we see that comes through um, Factiva, that comes through DNA, and it mentions that BlackRock is putting a new innovation center in Atlanta. We run it through a whole bunch of NLP tools that I barely understand, but it's okay. Um, and it generate this event and populate that event on the graph. So we know that this is an event type of facility opening. Um, there's a city, this is tied into a geographic um, graph, it's, so we know that there's this concept of Atlanta is in Georgia, which is in the southeastern United States, all that. And then we also know that it's affecting this company, and this company is a company that we have names, we have DUNS numbers, we have ticker symbols, <laughs> we have all the data that Dow Jones traditionally has around that customer. But we also now know in this virtual graph that one of our customers refers to this entity by this CRM identity. And we then know that it's linked as a company of interest to that customer. So um, it becomes very easy for us to take this um, fact, format it, we're putting it onto in, through a, um, in some cases we just deliver it as a spreadsheet, but we can you know, format it as a, on our APIs and push it into our customer's data lake. They ingest this information and they're able to do things with it. They're able to, first of all, put it into things like Marketo or Pardot, their, their lead scoring systems, their marketing automation tools, they're able to say, well, wait a second. We know this first party data about this lead, but now we know that this fact in the news is something that might be of interest because if they're opening a new facility in one of our regions, that means that actually our marketing qualified lead score should go up. We should get a salesperson to actually take action on this news event. Uh, we also do this for them on, um, and for some customers on things like uh, uh, preventing customer churn, um, bad debt, uh, identifying uh, potential opportunities for upsell. So a lot of times, for instance, energy companies, if you um, are moving um, or have a, uh, if your company is launching a new product, especially if you're in an industrial, uh, that's a reason for them to pick up the phone and renegotiate um, some of your energy contracts. So if we get this stuff out, it actually means that our customers are then able to say, okay, this is an action we can take, uh, push it into that, it means that all this stuff is actually within these workflows. It is removed this whole step that previously occurred, which was having them expected to read all of the news, identifying these events that are important to them, figuring out how they're important to them and what action to take. We've basically reduced a large part of that process so that their salespeople can focus on the important task, which is taking action. So that's basically a brief overview of some of the work that we're doing, uh, thanks to the technology provided by Stardog um, and some of the work that we're doing uh, across some of our NLP tools. Um, I'm happy to take any questions.